Right, so it's my pleasure to welcome Hunter Dinkins, our very own, um, who will talk to us about curve counts, representation theory, and 3D mirror symmetry. Okay, uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I, uh, so I'm gonna spend maybe a good chunk, well, okay, maybe like five, six, or perhaps more of this talk is just be like sort of giving some idea about what the ideas are that I work with. Um, so I don't have like a main result of my own that I'm building up towards, although I'll mention a few things later on and a few like um, potential projects that I'm thinking of currently and um, sort of in progress. So I want to start um, by talking about sort of the general philosophy of curve um, enumerative algebraic geometry. I know that may or may not be familiar with people here. Um, so I'm going to talk sort of generally and, and a bit vaguely first. Uh, then I'm going to sort of zero in on the specific flavor of enumerative geometry that I work with, uh, which is uh, the flavor of stable quasi maps. And then I'm going to zoom in a bit further and specialize and talk about uh, what this looks like for Nakajima varieties. So Nakajima varieties are sort of a geometric object that uh, more or less by design is uh, made to bridge geometry and representation theory. So um, we should expect something interesting, you know, anything interesting geometric should also have some interesting representation theory if it comes from the Nakajima variety. Uh, yeah, and then I'm, after that, I'm going to talk about some future directions and uh, works in progress. So uh, the subject of enumerative geometry, uh, when I'm talking, you know, to my friends who don't do math, I say something like this. <laughs> uh, you know, you can ask questions like, how many lines, you know, are there through two points? And most people know that the answer is one. Um, you know, unless the points are the same point, you know, or, uh, you know, so, but uh, I don't tell my friends about that. Um, then you can also ask the question, you know, how many conics you have through five points, uh, one also. Um, this is a more interesting one. Now, if you have a cubic and a cubic curve, uh, a cubic surface, and it's going to have 27 lines on it. Um, these are all very classical enumerative uh, questions. We have to do counting things. Um, but the modern flavor of enumerative geometry, it feels a lot more like esoteric. Um, so usually the way that people think about it is they want to take uh, their objects they're interested in studying and sort of study them all at once. So put them into a moduli space. So the easiest example of you know, moduli space is projective space. The point in projective space is a line inside of a complex uh, vector space. Now, uh, okay, so usually in modern subjects, we want to think about moduli spaces instead of the specific objects themselves. And also, usually we have to do something uh, kind of complicated. Usually the moduli spaces of objects that we're interested in on their own usually don't have good properties. Um, you know, they're not compact or something like that. And uh, sort of a heuristic example to think about is um, this family of uh, curves inside of C2. Um, you know, for any value of t not zero, uh, you get uh, a nice conic. And then when t is zero, you degenerate to uh, a union of two lines. So, you know, if you want to study smooth conics, uh, you're not going to have, uh, you know, good compactness properties unless you lock something singular also. So today I want to specialize to the enumerative question of uh, counting curves inside of some fixed ambient space. So, yeah. Sorry, can you say again? Um, the degenerates. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're considering a family of curves. Family of yeah. t. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're saying taking t to infinity gives you. Oh, uh, t to zero. Yeah. T to zero. Yeah. Yeah. So taking t to zero will give you. Oh, you did using the two axes. Yeah. So I want to think. Uh, so we're still a bit vague here. Um, but one way to sort of uh, start moving in this direction is to think about a curve uh, as like an equivalence classes of parameterized curves or, or maps from curves into my target space. And so uh, I'm going to denote with this notation MGN X beta, uh, the moduli space, um, parameterizing tuples. Uh, so it's going to be a, a collection of data. C is going to be some smooth. Uh, genus G curve, and I'm going to have some collection of markings along the curve. Uh, F is an embedding into X, and usually people 
you record the data of the um, homology class of the curve as well. So the curve is in the mental class and you push it forward with X and you get some uh, something inside of H2 of X. So we're gonna let this be some moduli space. And so what I'm about to say is, is uh, what needs to be corrected, but the philosophy about counting curves is like, okay, if I wanna count curves that's some space, you know, probably there's gonna be some infinite answer. So I need to impose some sort of constraints on curves. I just wanna count every single curve, uh, but I need to have some, some properties, right? Like I wanna count lines through two points or something like that. So the way that we think about that is uh, there's a natural map from this space parametrizing curves to X, and it's just the evaluation map. So my points inside this moduli space are curves with an embedding to X, and then some marked points along the curve. So I can just send that to uh, evaluate the map at the point, at a particular point. So there's a collection of natural uh, maps that go from the moduli space to X. And sort of the way that you should think about it is um, we're going to impose constraints on curves by um, pulling back classes from X using these evaluation maps. So the way that it goes is if you think about it, you have some smooth, smooth sub varieties inside of X, and maybe we'll assume that everything's nice so we can talk about fundamental classes of these sub varieties. Um, so you think about the fundamental class of one of these VIs. Okay, well, let's think about it as Poincaré dual is a cohomology class. So uh, I can pull that back from X to the moduli space. And one interpretation of the cup product in cohomology is that uh, under Poincaré duality, cup product is like doing uh, intersections, um, provided everything is nice and transverse. So if I you know, take these sub varieties and then I take their point for dual classes alpha i and I pull them back to the moduli space and then I cup them all together, uh, this cohomology class I get is going to be a point for a dual to the locus of maps where each of the marked points lands inside of uh, the given sub variety. So uh, what we do, assuming that, you know, maybe I pick all these constraints. Uh, uh, sorry, can I ask? Uh, so yeah. as you said, this Poincaré duality would be true if that locus were smooth, but if it's not, yeah. the, I take it this is your working definition of the Poincaré. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this is sort of a vague definition. There's a lot of uh, things that need to be clarified or um, worked through here. Yeah. So let's assume that everything's smooth and all the intersections are transverse, and then this is uh, more or less true. Uh, but so if, in the case where but, I get, uh, you could take it as a working definition, so to speak. I mean, other uh, a pro working provisional uh, philosophy. Okay, all right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, if I do that, and then uh, if I get something where uh, that lives inside the top cohomology, then I can pair it with the fundamental class. All right, again, this is a you know, philosophy because probably this doesn't exist. All right, well, if you know, everything worked out beautifully. I would get something that's supposed to be like the number of curves in X um, passing through each of these sub varieties. So, so what you should take away this is that we sort of recast questions about counting curves with certain constraints as uh, some question about um, integrating over uh, fundamental cycles in homology. So the modern subject of enumerative geometry has, uh, you know, some complications. So uh, this moduli space may not be compact in any nice sense. Uh, so there may not be any uh, fundamental class that exists. So usually, uh, pretty much always, uh, we need to build some sort of compactification of it. So I'll denote that by M bar, but it's not, it's not defined. It's just, I need to try to find an M bar. Uh, but even if I were to do that, uh, oftentimes this M bar is very bad. Uh, it's just really complicated. It's got uh, well, non-reduced scheme structure, components of different dimensions. Um, so it may have some fundamental class, uh, but it, it may be very complicated. Um, or you know, if you have components of different dimensions, you sort of uh, don't really have a nice fundamental class already. So uh, a very technical uh, construction that I don't want to talk at all about today is that in many situations, 
uh, you can fix some of these issues. So there's some concept of virtual classes where they sort of fix some of these bad properties about uh, the fundamental class or uh, the compactification. And in particular, the, the virtual class uh, lives inside of one particular uh, homological degree. Okay, so uh, and, and you know, it's usually called the expected dimension. Um, and that has some precise meaning, um, but I don't want to get into it. Okay, so modern enumerative geometry, what we would do is we build some compactification and we hope that we can fix this problem of bad fundamental classes. And then, uh, then what we want to do is we want to think about doing integrals over these uh, virtual classes or in K theory, uh, thinking about taking Euler characteristics of um, natural, natural classes. So I mean, I talked about the homology story, but in K theory, uh, you get some virtual structure sheet, which is sort of supposed to be better in some sense than usual structure sheet. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so this is sort of, uh, you know, the last slide is sort of supposed to convince you that these are like worthy objects of study. If you take certain classes on X and pull them back to your moduli space and then integrate them, you should get something interesting. Um, and in really, really nice situations, it'll have some sort of actual like enumerative meaning, like I really counted something. Uh, but most of the time it's just that, uh, you know, you're sort of supposed to pretend like it's something enumerative or, um, you know, yeah. Hunter, can I ask a very, very basic question? How, yes. how, how is the Euler class at the bottom of your slide? How, how can we think of that as, as a form of counting in K-theory? I mean, the integral you justified earlier, yes. right? Um, but, but, uh, yeah, yeah, um, that's a good question. I, I think that, I don't think I have a good answer to that question about as far as what is it counting? I think probably it doesn't count anything, but you should, um, I guess if you're convinced that homology is sort of like counting something, then uh, the next level up would be a key theory. Yeah. So like integrating over you know, inter integrals are sort of like doing a uh, push forward to a point, which is like Euler characteristic in key theory. Uh, well, it is. It literally is Euler characteristic. Um, yeah. So it, do it doesn't really count anything, but it's sort of like the natural upgrade of the homology question. Sorry. And what does it mean, over tensor tautological classes? I mean, yeah, so over, so it's supposed to be some. Over, okay, so it's the sheaf supported on this, I mean, whatever, I mean, heuristically, but what does it mean to, to tensor a sheaf by cohomology class? Yeah, so, uh, okay, so these are supposed to be tautological uh, K theory classes. So in some situations, you'll, you may have some uh, natural vector bundles. Um, oh, they're not the same, I see, so they're not the same tautological classes. I mean, they're well, not. Yeah, these are different. But, but they're tautological in the sense that they're both pulled back from the space X. Right, so right, 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 right. Yes, yes. From the, uh, you know, from the space. Okay, thank you. Uh, so it lives inside what people call the expected dimension. Um, it, yeah, it's a bit complicated to say. In some simple situations, if you, if you, your moduli space is like, uh, Cut out by like a transverse section of a vector bundle over some space. Uh, it, 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 the expected dimension is sort of what it should be. Uh, and in general, there's some concept of expected dimension um, if you have some enumerative setup. Uh, but the point is, it's just it lives inside of one degree. So it sort of should be thought of as a fundamental class. I have a yeah. extremely basic question, yeah. which is the, the one of the examples that you gave in the beginning, in the beginning was, you know, counting the number of lines for two points. Yeah. Uh, can that can that be phrased? Phrase right? it this way. Uh, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Would your V's be? They would be able to spend two points. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. Let's see. So uh, if you're counting lines, uh, your moduli space would be like projective space. So, you could, uh, so if you're counting lines inside of like C2, you would think of P2 uh -huh. or uh, uh, P1. Uh, yeah, and then, um, yeah, so you pick, uh, so you'd pick your, you pick two points, and then you would uh, take the classes of the points and pull them back uh, from, 
Yeah. So okay. So I, I'm pretty sure there's something you can say, but if I try to say it, I'll probably mess it up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But the question you say surely can be rephrased in sort of this way. But you won't need anything virtual. Surely it'll just be like a fundamental class and something like that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, so the process of going from uh, this space M, uh, so M is uh, previous was denoted as M G N X beta. So the space which uh, parameterizes like smooth uh, curves along with an embedding and some mark points. Uh, so getting a compactification is generally a very hard problem. And there aren't like that many ways that are known to do this. So here are a few examples of ways that people know. So uh, the, the most famous and oldest one is the moduli space of stable maps, which was defined by uh, Konsevich. And uh, what you should sort of think of is like, you know, uh, so the example I said about uh, the family of non-singular connects, so x, y equals t. When t goes to zero, this degenerates to the meaning of two lines. Uh, that sort of picture is, is sort of the way that uh, stable maps are kind of built. So rather than parametrizing only smooth curves, uh, you need to allow some sort of nodes, um, but it's in a more or less controlled way. So it's not, it's not like arbitrarily bad, but you do need to allow the, the domains of your uh, curves to, to degenerate and break off. These give you some boundary components in your moduli space. So this is a very famous one. Uh, other ones that are kind of interesting, um, maybe only if you're in the case of, of X being a, a threefold, uh, you, can, you can think about curves uh, as given by their ideal sheaves. And then uh, you, people have built moduli spaces of Donaldson Thomas or Hunter, Hunter Thomas uh, moduli spaces. And these are built by sort of taking the sheaf and then like relaxing some conditions about it. So if you have a curve, it's uh, the sheet that cuts it out inside of X is a very special sheet and has very strict properties. Uh, but if you relax some of these properties uh, and then consider all such sheaves, then um, this will this will allow you to uh, this takes you to PT or PT theory. Okay, but the example that I'm going to talk about today is if you have a very special type of target space. So if your target space is something called a GIT quotient, and we'll give a little rundown about what that means. In the next slide. Uh, but in that case, there's, there's a, a much nicer uh, moduli space that's going to compactify the space of curves. And it's called the moduli space of uh, stable quasi maps. And the idea is sort of that, like in, in the stable map setting, I, I, need, I sort of allow my domain and my curves to break. I get some nodal curves. But in uh, this setting, uh, we, we don't allow our curves to break. Instead, uh, we allow the map to acquire singularities. So we compactify by uh, relaxing the condition that the embedding uh, is actually an embedding. We can pick up some singular points. So let me talk more specifically about stable quasi maps. Sorry, Hunter, you just, could, yes. could you give us like a, a quick, like a very uh, cheap flavor of the difference between those two things? So, I mean, how, how does how does how does allowing? I mean, I understand that on the face of it, allowing singularity to the map is not the same as allowing nodes in the domain. But do these things things talk, talk to each other at all, or they're really completely orthogonal? I mean, or you know, does one thing allow? You know, is one thing a subset of the other? Do we have an interesting intersection in these two? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So the a lot of the complexity in the stable map case is that your curve C becomes very complicated. You can acquire many many components. Um, connected via nodes. Um, quasi maps are sort of nicer, but there is, uh, I'm going to talk about a, a special uh, subset of quasi maps, but there's uh, a little bit of a more relaxed notion uh, like epsilon quasi maps, people will say. Um, and there is some way actually to, uh, to walk across between stable maps and quasi maps. So in general, they are very different. Now, I wouldn't say that either is a subset of the other, um, but there is some way uh, in the case where X is a GIT quotient, there is some way to, to uh, connect the two stories. Um, I guess, to, yeah, to say more specific, um, maybe, uh, I'm not sure if I can do that right now. Okay. Yeah, is that, does that uh, sort of address the question? 
Okay, and you said wall crossing somehow. Okay, maybe that's that's yes, something. wall crossing between quasi maps and stable maps in the GIT. In the GIT setting, no, only in the GIT setting. Okay. Yeah, so stable maps is a super general, and you can consider them for uh, great uh, generality of spaces. But for quasi maps, you need your target space to be a GIT quotient. All right, so let me uh, review and, uh, you know, if you've never seen it before, I'll try to give you some idea about what a GIT quotient is. So uh, these were uh, built by Mumford, uh, and it's a way of constructing quotients in algebraic geometry. So um, you can always consider, like, if you have a group acting on a space, you can always think about in the set of orbits of your group action. And the point is that we, you know, we want the quotient to be like the set of orbits. Uh, but sometimes there's no good way to put a variety structure on the set of orbits. So you have to do something harder. Um, yeah, so I'm not going to say all the details of GIT uh, construction, but in the case where you have a group G, uh, so it needs to be a complex reductive group acting on uh, a variety of Y. Uh, and then you need to pick a uh, character G. So you pick some map from G to C star. So Mumford gives some way to define some uh, dense open subset of Y. And this dense open subset is called the space of stable points. And the action of G on the stable points is very nice. Um, so by that, I mean, it's got, um, you, uh, so the dimensions of the orbits are as large as they could possibly be. Um, yeah, and so in, in good cases, this means that uh, that G acts on the stable points with, uh, with trivial stabilizers, there's no stabilizers. So in this case, uh, when we have this setup, uh, we can define a quotient uh, and we take the stable points, at least as a set, it's the stable points modulo the action of G. So it's the set of orbits inside the stable points. And I should say for people who know here, uh, I'm gonna assume there's also a concept of semi-stable points in geometric theory, but I'm, I'm gonna assume that they're the same. Stable points and semi-stable points are the same. This is a necessary uh, assumption to do quasi map theory. So, uh, hey. so, uh, all right, so let me show an example. So uh, the, you should think of, of GIT quotients as a way of generalizing construction of projective space. So if you have uh, Y as Cn plus one and G acts on that diagonally. So the set of orbits is bad. Uh, all right, well, it's a set, right? It's lines inside of Cn plus one, and then you get one extra orbit for the orbit of zero. But uh, the reason it's bad is sort of like, you know, if you start in any orbit, you can always kind of contract down towards zero. So this means that like in any reasonable, like quotient space, uh, every orbit, uh, the, the orbit of zero will be inside the closure of every other orbit. So you get something like highly non-separated. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's bad. So the way to fix that is you just throw away zero and then you take your quotient. And that's, uh, this is for a certain choice of character of uh, C star, this is exactly the geometric invariant theory construction. The stable points are Cn plus one minus zero. And then you take your usual quotient and you get P1, which has a nice variety of structure on it. So in, in general, GIT quotient is the same thing. You throw away your bad points so that you can get a good quotient. Yeah, so when you say that uh, you must assume stability and semi stability to be the same, is an assumption on the character or on the group action? Um, it's an assumption on the group action and the character. So yeah, the stable, so the stable and semi stable points depend on the choice of character. Ah. Yeah. So you may have some group actions where you know, some characters that satisfy and some characters it's not. Um, here's another example of a GIT quotient. Um, so, and it's a really important example in the Nakajima variety story. So uh, it's this space, and uh, Josh mentioned a few weeks ago, the Hilbert scheme of endpoints in C2. And um, the most down-to-earth way to think about it 
is just as a set. So as a set, it's ideals inside a two variable polynomial ring. So that when you are quotient by the ideal, um, you get an n-dimensional vector space over C. So, you know, the ideal x, y is going to give you a one-dimensional vector space. So that would, that would be a point inside of the Hilbert scheme of one point in C2, which is actually just C2. <laughs> but in general, this, this thing is supposed to be like a resolution. I mean, it's supposed to sort of parametrize points inside of C2, but maybe it records some sort of multiplicity data as well. So this space can be constructed as a GIT quotient. So a priori, it's just a set, but uh, yeah, we can construct it as a GIT quotient. Maybe I think I may I may skip the details um, if that's okay. But this is called the ADHM construction, and uh, every, you know, points like this everything's really explicit. Vector space, some linear maps, and you know, stable points have some explicit description uh, for a certain choice of character. And, um, yeah. All right, so what is a quasi map? What is this compactification of spaces of curves? So let's think about it. So a, G, a GIT quotient uh, by definition is the set of orbits inside the stable locus. So let's think about what is a curve uh, inside of, well, what, yeah, what is an embedding of a curve inside of X? All right, so X is a quotient of G. So I naturally have some map from the stable points to X and the fibers of that map, uh, the fibers of this vertical map on the right side uh, are uh, isomorphic to G, canonically, but uh, is, in other words, this is a principal G bundle over X. And so if I have a map from a curve to X, uh, well, we can pull back principal bundles. So I can consider a principal bundle P over C and then pullback construction uh, gives me this vertical map on the top. And that map is G equivariant. This definition of pullback. So, so what we get when we have an embedding from a curve, we have an embedding of a curve into a GIT quotient. What I get is a principal G bundle over the curve. And then uh, I get some G equivariant map, the stable points. Um, and it's a short exercise to show that that's equivalent to this, um, to a section of uh, this induced bundle over the curve. So this induced bundle, uh, this notation, you know, means you consider P cross the stable points, and then there's a, a action. It's, it's not that action, but it's G, G inverse action. And then you quotient via that action. So this is a, uh, Ys bundle over the curve. You think of this as being like the graph of the snap from yeah. the GFB line? Yeah, yeah, that's one way to think about it. So what you get is a principal bundle over the curve, and then I get this section. And so if I you know if I pick any points in the curve and apply this section to it, um, I get something that lands inside a, a, a fiber that's isomorphic to the stable points. So you sort of think, okay, I got a map from the curve into the stable points, sort of gets recast in this way. All right, so how can we use this to compactify? I'm sorry, I, I missed a point. Sorry, Hunter. Yes. But how does that? How does the map from the curve to the stable points? So you have a map to to, to x, but 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 to so, x. So I have a map here. Yeah. And then uh, this arrow on the right side is a principal G bundle over x. That's just a definition of X. Yes. So I can pull it back and get a principal bundle over the curve. Oh, that I see. I, I, I just, I'm so this, Yeah, so uh, this section here, uh, this comes from what you do is you, so given a point inside the curve, uh, I lift it to any point inside of P, and then I map it forward over here. And then that depends on the choice of lift. And the way to, to sort of uh, factor out this choice of lift is by taking the, um, the product of the G. Yeah. Uh, okay, I see, I see. I see. Mm -hmm. So the way this helps us compactify curves is well, we naturally have sort of some, some bigger space that uh, the stable point sits inside of. 
So they naturally sit inside of all the points. <laughs> so we may hope that you know we can compactify uh, this space of principal bundles over the curve on some section of the induced bundle uh, by considering uh, something bigger. So I uh, consider principal bundles over the curve along with a section of this bundle, which is which is different. So I don't necessarily consider stable points. I can't see where you're pointing. So this bundle is oh uh, is right, right, right. T cross G. Yes. Uh, y. Yes, yeah. thank you. This and here, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, sorry, I didn't realize yeah, that. Yeah. 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 Sorry about that. Yeah. And also right there it's, it's <laughs> Oops. I think I think maybe my mouse. You can see my mouse, right? Yeah. Oh, I'll try that. Okay. okay. Just, just I can't see the mouse. Yes. Thanks a lot. Okay. Yeah, it's in this bundle. <laughs> this bundle. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. This <laughs> makes sense. Yes. <laughs> so the setup of stable points inside of all points uh, naturally leads to something that we might hope uh, can lead to a compactification. That's that's good. Uh, so the case is that that is true if we also assume some technical conditions. Um, now, maybe the main technical condition to say is that um, this section uh, uh, to P cross Y over G, uh, this section uh, lands inside of the stable points uh, except at finite infinity points. So usually it's a legit map, but sometimes it may have some singularities. Singularities are, are where it doesn't land inside the stable points. Right. So, uh, I mean, I guess you, know, yeah. you probably don't want to go into details, but I mean, how subtle does it get? Like, I mean, you have like these, like, uh, these, like, uh, how subtle, like these, like, one, yeah, these, what are these called? These, uh, Carol and Ness one parameter subgroups. Like, you have this Carol and Ness stratification for, yeah, like YS and then, like, kind of progressively worse and worse strata. And like, do you, no. is it like, do you try to pick those apart or is it just like, no, stable and then non stable? Stable, yeah, it's okay. just two. Yeah, so okay. Stable and unstable. The main, yeah, the conditions are not that bad. I just okay. Them. Okay. So you assume that most most of the time, almost always, you're inside the stable points, and then the other condition is that something about some painfulness of some bundle over the curve, but it's not important for us. Uh, okay. All right. So the theorem uh, is that this is a, a good thing to do, <laughs> and it's work. It's work to show this, you know. Uh, but one thing I really like about this subject is like, you know, just depending on what perspective you think of a curve as, you naturally get so many different options, stable maps uh, versus quasi maps or thinking of the sheaves. So, um, you know, once you sort of recast this way, it's only a, a natural step to, to jump and say, maybe rather than considering just stable points, maybe I should consider all points and maybe I can build something useful that way. So in general, quasi maps are a lot easier to work with than stable maps. And the reason for that is that your domain curve is much nicer. But for stable maps, you can have um, many, many nodes and many components uh, that sort of grow and branch off your curve that you started with. But for quasi maps, that's much more control. So I want to specialize this to the case of Nakajima varieties, which is where a lot of interesting structure shows up. Yeah, question. Uh, do you bring markings into the picture here? Right. Uh, yeah. 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 So you can bring in markings too. I think. Yeah, exactly. I think I maybe wrote that here, but I didn't say it. Yeah. You can consider all this with as many markings as you want, and probably you should think about maybe fixing the genus of the curve. Um, and, and then uh, this D here is is like a degree, uh, which is it's uh, some some natural uh, discrete uh, invariant quasi map. So I can I ask also a question because it, so you now by by, refra by sort of uh, rephrasing the problem that you, now you have so a principal bundle which okay that's uh, sort of easy to understand on C but yeah. then you have this section right so but yeah. this section is again a kind of curve inside P cross uh, Y over G so mm -hmm. so so then it's it is some kind of curve count or some 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 type of curve for P cross Y over G right yes. Uh -huh. So I'm just wondering, I don't know what, I don't have exactly a precise question. I'm just wondering what kind of a map is it? So this is presumably not a stable map because you just told us the stable maps are, fi are finicky. So, so it's, it's probably a much more constrained map than that, the map from C to... Well, uh, so stable maps are always forced to live inside of the space I'm interested in. 
So for stable maps, like sort of the analog of a stable map, I always insist that I land inside of the stable points. And if a stable is being used in two different ways here. But a stable map is always going to actually. Uh, no, sorry, I, I guess I sorry, I, I, I meant I meant I think I meant stable curve. So what I'm saying is this this section, you can think of it as I guess as a curve, as the curve C sitting inside, maybe up to some of, of P cross uh, Y over G, right? Yeah. So curve inside there. So I'm wondering, is that presumably you want to constrain that curve, but this is probably what you meant by some conditions, you know, yeah. with I mean pretty in a pretty tight way because it one could imagine, oh, well, that could be a stable curve in the sense of Konsevich, but that's probably not something you want to allow. Oh, right, right. I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, would it be a stable curve? It, it might be a stable curve in the sense of Konsevich. You're talking about the curve from C to P cross Y over G? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that may be a stable curve in, in the Konsevich sense. Um, but it might be all of them this way. I guess that's the point. Uh, but I don't think you have many other things that also would be considered stable curves. Or stable. Right. It's, it's not as general as it might be stable, but it, it probably is going to satisfy a bunch more curves. So otherwise, it's, it's not. Yes. Uh, yeah. These conditions should be much more constraining than. But there's a, some conditions is a, is a list, is a long, maybe not long, I don't know, but some list. Yeah. Yeah. But if you were thinking of this as like a Konsevich stable map, uh, it's in the wrong space now. It's, a, you know, it'd be like a stable map inside of P cross Y over G. But originally, I wanted to. Consider X, which is just the quotient. Of the yeah, yeah, no, I understand. It's a, it's a stable map towards towards in in a, in a different target. No, I understand that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, great. Okay, so I want to specialize to Nakajima varieties, and I mentioned the Hilbert scheme of points in C two. This is like the the premier example, <laughs> sort of the a really interesting and important one. Um, and I'm not going to review the whole construction of an Arcajima variety, but I'd love to, if anybody doesn't know and wants to learn, I'd love to talk with you about it some other time. Um, but the data that you need to build one is you need to fix a quiver Q, and it's got some vertex set I, and then you pick uh, a dimension. So you pick a, a non negative integer for each vertex, and then you do that again. So I call those V, and I call that W. Uh, v is called the dimension, and people call W the framing dimension. Uh, once you do that, uh, Nakajima uh, showed some way to construct um, what he calls quiver varieties, and they're uh, given as geometric invariant three quotients. So um, this uh, mu is, there's some, I don't want to write all the information about it, but uh, it's mu inverse zero, uh, some map, uh, you know, fiber of some map, stable points inside of it. Um, and Nakajima uses these to construct, the reason he introduced them was to build modules over uh, Katsumuri algebras and then uh, quantized enveloping algebras uh, of the affine, so uh, U2G paths. Uh, so, so, you know, examples to keep in mind here uh, the, the simplest example is cotangent bundle of projective space, or more generally, cotangent bundles of uh, Grassmannians or partial five varieties in type A. These are all Nakajima varieties. And then the Hilbert scheme of points in C2, or more generally, Hilbert scheme of points on um, uh, resolutions of type A surface singularities. Is this setting the stable and semi-stable points? And yes, yes. That's, uh, yeah, that's proven from Nakajima. Stable and semi-stable are the same. So these are generally good, good spaces. I mean, you can work with them like in a hands-on way. You know, there's some quiver, you know, stuff that happens, and um, they're smooth. They're symplectic, quasi-projective, uh, and they have a natural torus action. And uh, in type A, which is usually what I'm thinking about, and, and this fits the Hilbert scheme uh, for a type A quiver, the torus action has finitely fixed points. Uh, which means that it's you know it allows you to produce explicit formulas to some extent. So so not the gene varieties here here they are, and we want to consider uh, quasi maps to them. How do we count curves inside of them? So let's move to this. Okay, so inside of uh, this space here, quasi maps with genus zero and one marked point. This is a, a very simple case of the more general construction. So genus zero, one marked point, 
uh, there's a distinguished open subset. And these are quasi maps that actually come from P1. So they're quasi maps from P1 to X. And I want to insist that the marked point is infinity inside of P1. I mean, you can pick zero, but uh, you want to pick some torus fixed point inside of P1, uh, P1 with an actual torus action. So that's what this NS infinity. Uh, I mean, it also just means infinity is a marked point, and usually in this whole world, uh, marked points, you shouldn't have singularities in marked points. Right? Um, but yeah, so we can consider this open subset, and um, this is going to actually allow us to start uh, bringing this all back to the geometry of X, because I have some evaluation map. I can just, uh, I have a quasi map from infinity to X, or sorry, quasi map from P1 to X, and if it doesn't have a singularity at infinity, then I can plug in infinity and I'll get an actual point in X. So I actually have some map here. And this is, leads to the main definition um, of Akhmatov, which is of the vertex function. People also call these you know, I functions or J functions, depending on who you ask. So you don't impose any compatibility on the action the torus action on p1 with the group action but that you quotient that by in x no. uh, you said it was, you want to choose e? yeah because you want to choose infinity as a fixed point that's why. yeah i want to yeah so so i do need to i do need to take into account the big the um, natural torus action on p1 yeah so the way that we do that well all right so on these quasi math moduli spaces this is where we start getting a little more technical all right, what I want to do is I want to take the virtual structure sheet, um, which lives over, um, maybe I should have superscripted it, a D, but uh, there's some, I mentioned a discrete invariant called degree that gets attached to quasi maps. So I want to take the virtual sheet over each degree, and I just want to push it forward to X, to sort of like integrating over the fibers that in the degree side. So I want to push it forward to X, all right, well, there's a slight problem and it's that you can only push forward in K theory if you have a proper map. And this map is not proper, uh, but the way we fix it is by uh, taking into account equivariance. So um, mm -hmm. a, a mm -hmm. trick that uh, you can commonly do if you, if you wanna push forward under a non-proper map, but you have a torus action, you can first restrict to the torus fixed points. And if the torus fixed points are proper, you can then push forward from there. So sometimes you can still push forward from non-proper maps, uh, but there is a price you pay, and it's uh, subscripted here in this loop. Uh, means that you have to localize your KPU. So you must allow for some uh, denominators that uh, inside of the parameters of your uh, torus. So this is why I need to consider everything. This is why I need uh, to pick infinity or some fixed point, because I, I have to um, localize with respect to that action, the action P1. Yeah. All right, so this is supposed to be, uh, I mean, this is a formidable object, we'll say. These virtual classes are, are hard and complicated and, um, you know, constructions of moduli spaces is generally uh, fairly challenging. Um, but, it, you know, so that's why maybe you think we, were, we should restrict to a simple case of genus zero curves, maybe only one marked point um, and see what we can do. Um, and it turns out that it's actually uh, manageable in some cases. So for type A Nakajima varieties, you can you can write uh, formulas for things like this. You compute them. You can program them on a computer, um, and it's it's not that bad. <laughs> and actually, uh, the plus side is that uh, you know we restrict to a very simple case, genus zero. Um, in general, for, for more complicated curves, uh, there are some very general degeneration arguments that sort of reduce uh, higher genus quasi map counts to uh, genus zero quasi map counts. It's not totally like a trivial way to go back and forth between the two, but at a very theoretical level, you know, genus zero sort of determines everything uh, in some sense. Okay, um, I may, uh, yeah, let's see. So I have a little less than five minutes left. Yeah, question. Uh, yeah, I guess, uh, where's A on the right hand side? Oh, yeah, yeah, I should explain my variables. Yeah, so this, uh, so A is supposed to be like the equivariant parameters of the torus T. 
Um, uh, yeah, yeah. And so like, you know, it's an object of K theory, um, but I got it by restricting to fixed points and then pushing forward first. So really you can think of it as like some vector, uh, each component is in the key theory of the class. This is kind of how you think of it. Right? So if you think of it like that, you really do have some function of the equilibrium parameters. Uh, Z is a variable we insert that re records degrees of quasi maps. Yeah, I, I should have explained that. But yeah, these are the meaning of these, these important variables. All right, so this vertex function is the main thing that I'm interested in studying. And that means that I might skip the representation theory part of this talk, which is the next uh, two slides. Hey, Hunter, you, yeah. you have a lot more. But we started yeah. pretty late, so you have you have about 13 minutes to go. Uh, okay. You just have Valerio teaches at four. Right? I, I teach at four, but I am actually teaching virtually for the same reason that I'm not here. <laughs> so, okay, so okay. I, I can at some point excuse myself and then start my class. Sure, good. Okay. All right. Let me, let me... I, I can I can I can be on for another 13 minutes, and then you can, I guess, I said it can go on for you know longer if you want. Yeah. Yeah, okay. okay. Well, don't count representation theory, in other words. Sure, yeah. sure, we can talk about the where does representation theory come in. So that vertex function, maybe this is my, my main interest thing, and I'm going to come back to um, what questions I'm trying to study about them. But there's also some other things you can consider. You know, that was one really specific scenario about, you know, I'm going to do genus zero, one marked point. And then I had to do, I had a non-proper space, and I wanted to push forward from it, so I had to do something, you know, some localization. All right, well, there's also some way to uh, sort of hack that problem um, and to <laughs> build another compactification of the space. So I sort of built quasi maps as a compactification of maps of curves, uh, sort of the way the story goes. But uh, once I actually wanted to like get some evaluation maps, it turned out that I broke the, the properness. Uh, but there's a way to fix it uh, with some notion of relative quasi maps. So these ones, uh, you should know that uh, the evaluation map, there is an evaluation map, and it turns out to be proper. So you don't have to localize to push forward. Uh, intuitively, the relative quasi maps, you, you pay you pay a price uh, because now you have to you do have to allow your domain trip to break again. So I, I might want to consider quasi maps from P1, but if I'm doing it in a relative setting, I, I actually have some something to frame that. Uh, P1 with some extra uh, tails of P1s attached to it. So, uh, yeah. So there's something else you can do in some other uh, natural quasi map space. And let me skip the first definition on this slide. That's not that really important at all for us. Um, but the second one uh, is so, what is going on here? So, and I actually consider quasi map moduli spaces where I impose two conditions, so two marked points. And the marked point at zero, I'm going to insist is a relative marking. And the marked point at infinity is a uh, non singular. So I assume that I've got a quasi map from P1, and, uh, but potentially at zero, it's got some extra things attached to it. And this is if. If you want to work equivariantly with respect to the torus action in P1, this is sort of one of the few things that you can actually do. If I'm, what marking should I? I should only ever mark zero and infinity. And as I've told you, we sort of can think of them as non singular marked points or relative marked points. So this is like, you know, one of uh, three possibilities where you have uh, two markings, both non singular, both relative, or uh, one and one. So it's not completely arbitrary. You know, there's something kind of remarkable about it. And this is where the representation theory comes in. So this thing, uh, as I know it, people call it the capping operator. Actually, maybe I'm not ready to move on yet. I, I need to point out that. Uh, so I'm pushing forward with respect to the product of the two evaluation maps. So I get something that lands inside of the k-theory of the product of x with x. So I, I go from I got two marked points, so I get two points inside of X. And I did have to localize again because I had a non-singular marked point. So this is complicated. 
But if you, uh, if you have finitely many fixed points, you can restrict to them, and what you get is a matrix. Mm -hmm. Matrix, and you can put it on a computer and look at it, and that's it. It's a real matrix you know, with some with some entries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and uh, these are indexed by fixed points in X, not not in the fixed points inside X. Yeah, not in Y. Yeah, well, in X cross X. So it's uh, two dimensions. Yeah. Yep. So this thing, um, yeah, so the representation theory comes in with this thing. So there's two ways that I can uh, sort of think about shifting my variables. Uh, the first way, so I wrote my parameters A, and I, I said earlier that these represented points on side of uh, the torus T. Okay, actually, that wasn't quite true. There are, there are parameters on, on the subtorus that preserves some vector form. There's a natural subtorus. So if you consider a character, uh, a co-character of that torus, I can take all of the variables A and I can shift them according to this co-character. And it's a theorem that this, uh, you know, very complicated formal power series in Z satisfies some difference equations. If I shift via a co-character, I, I change via some matrix. And the same is true for the other set of variables. Um, but in this case, we uh, I didn't say exactly what the degree of a quasi map is, but it's sort of engineered in such a way that if you have a line bundle on X, that sort of records the data how you should shift your variables. So there's some way to shift both variables, and I get some uh, difference equation. And the difference equation in the equivariant parameters gets identified with the uh, QKZ operators of the quantum affine algebra associated to the program. So this is kind of a hard theorem. That's due to Ockham-Cog. And this uses his uh, sort of geometric constructions of these quantum affine algebras. And in the other set of variables, the this M operator can be identified using something called the quantum dynamical file group. And um, I think this might be all I want to say about this. Um, but this is the representation theory part. Right, so these uh, curve counting objects are constrained via some uh, known representation theoretic equations and operators. Are like quantum dynamical value? Yeah. I mean, in the sense of who? I mean, in the sense of Ockham Cobb's here now. Uh, but what it means, so. Um, and I would dynamical lab groups. So there's dynamical lab groups and there's quantum also, right? I believe so. No, that's yeah. in the sense of that's in the sense of Varshank writing off, at least for the case of a of a of, of uh, yeah, writing. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any off margin. Yeah, and that's the quantum growth in this. Uh yes, I believe so. I mean the version that I know is from Akram and Smirnov, and it works a little bit more generally. Uh -huh. Um do you think getting off Marchenko is only I think it's only for finite finite time, maybe only yeah, 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 of course. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. So this is a little bit more general where you can do oh, it for a to write all And uh, and um so so how is how is it, so psi psi is kind of also uniquely determined by this plus some asymptotic. So if I say psi is some function that satisfies the system of difference equation, um and <laughs> But it's it's unique solution that has a certain asymptotic behavior somewhere somewhere is is that is that that's true right? Uh, I believe so. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think actually on um, just one of these, uh, I, I think that one of these equations is enough. I don't think you actually need both of them. Mm. Mm. Uh, at least I, I know the second the second one is enough. I think but if you right. wear a differential equation, I don't know if you wear a differential equation. Well, I don't know, maybe maybe so. But if you wear a differential equation, you have a system of two two differential equations. I mean, just one of them, you would typically not expect it to determine uniquely the function, right? Unless, yeah, okay, yeah. unless initial value some some something very well. Well, yeah, depends. Yeah. You, yeah, it depends how much you want to specify on its asymptotic or equivalently or, or yeah, yeah. Value. 
equations. Yeah, you can recover it from one of the equations, but yeah, I may need to specify some more uh, some more data about it. Okay. Um, so, all right. So these the this capping operator and the vertex functions they're not so different from each other. Well, okay, they are pretty different from each other, but they're both defined in some more ways through some quasi math counting. Um, so, okay, there's some relationship between them, and the fact that the capping operator psi satisfies some different equations actually is also going to imply the same about the vertex, uh, but it's inexplicit. It's not like it's uh, we don't know what they are. So the QKZ equations are something that's known, and um, but we don't we don't know. We just we know it does satisfy some difference equations, but it's uh, not known what they are exactly. So uh, and, and that's uh, one of my questions that I'm interested in trying to do. People know them for like for cotangent bundle of projective space and cotangent bundle of full flag varieties, which I think is the first case. If you want, uh, but uh, even for cotangent bundles of grass manians, it's they're complicated. Nobody knows what they are. Let alone five public scheme points. All right, so uh, so I'll probably stop at four. So let me go for just a few more minutes. Um, so there's some three D mirror symmetry, and uh, what it means is is it has some origins in physics that I don't know. Uh, but what it means is that, so Nakajima variety is supposed to be one side of the story, but there's supposed to be another side of the story. Um, things called Coulomb branches, and Nakajima variety is supposed to be Higgs branches. And there's supposed to be some duality between uh, Coulomb and Higgs branches. And what it's supposed to be, or what's expected, is that the vertex functions uh, for the Higgs and Coulomb branch should uh, satisfy the same collection of difference equations. So they should give some solutions for them, um, but they're uh, they're going to be solutions uh, which have some different initial data. And in particular, the, the vertex functions for for uh, Nakajima variety and for its dual are supposed to satisfy the same equations, but actually, I have, after switching the parameters, so I've got my equivariant parameters on one side, and then these parameters which count curved degrees on the other side. And these are supposed to get switched with each other into this duality. So there's a few things that are known. Right? So I mentioned for cotangent bundles of full flag varieties, uh, these things satisfy the McDonald difference equations. Um, and that, that's proven using localization formulas and combinatorics. And uh, this gives a you know, satisfactory uh, proof of this 3D mirror symmetry problem. So since so this variety is supposed to be self-dual under 3D mirror symmetry. And since the difference equations in the two variables are the same, if I switch the variables, I still have the same equations. So uh, this vertex function will uh, do the job. It, will, it does satisfy the expected property. And for cotangent models of Grassmannian, uh, k planes in n-dimensional space, if 2k is less than or equal to n, uh, then the dual is known as an Nakajima variety. And the vertex functions also satisfy the, the mirror property. That's also proven. Okay, let's let's skip that. Uh, so I just want to say a few things about what I want to study. So most of the approaches so far have been very ad hoc, you know, like very very particular and specific. There's like only full flag varieties, but not the partial flag varieties. Or if you're going to say goodbye, Hunter. Sorry, I have to I have to go. But okay. yeah, thank you. If you could send me your slides. I would be very grateful, actually. Yeah, sure, I will, yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. So one thing that I want to do is to get some less ad hoc descriptions of this, all of this story. So my main interest that I'm thinking about right now is in uh, these things called bow varieties. Let's go from here. Yeah. So bow varieties are a class of varieties that contain type A Nakajima varieties, uh, but they also contain their duals as well. And they describe them as GIT quotients. So, uh, an interesting question is to try to get some uniform treatment of vertex functions for bow varieties, because this should be enough to handle um, all the varieties in the duals for type A. Uh, uh, duals, you mean under duals? Under 3D mirror symmetry. 
Yeah, so the pigs and Kulam, pigs and Kulam, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, let's, let's, let's stop here. I, I don't want to keep going, but if you want to talk more about it, the other questions, I'm also getting through. So, yeah, thank you all for listening. Any questions for Hunter? Or... Yeah, or desires for him to keep going. Oh, uh, yeah. just... I don't think we'll get kicked out until yeah, sure. it's just 4.30, but okay. I mean, 4 30, <laughs> it's fine. So, um, yeah, okay, so one thing, so I think I can do it for um, uh, separated bow varieties. So uh, what does this mean? Um, so bow variety comes from like some diagram of you know, something like this, some combinatorial diagrams, slashes, regressions. And there's a thing called Hanani Witten transition, and it lets you switch. So, this thing is supposed to represent some variety, and I'm able to switch them, but I also need some, I'm supposed to have some dimension numbers, some numerical data for the variety, too. So, I can switch these at the cost of changing some of the dimensions. Um, a separated bow variety is the one that I get when I switch all of them to one side and all of them to the other side. So you may say like, well, they're isomorphic, right? If I switch to, I get even, they're even equivariantly isomorphic. Um, but this quasi-map theory, uh, it really depends, it does depend very strongly on the specific GIT presentation. So even though these are the same bow variety, uh, they have very different GIT presentations. So their vertex functions actually can be very different. Um, so, so for separated ones, uh, I think separated ones are really nice. They sort of, bow varieties introduce some extra redundancy where like to recognize an academia variety as a bow variety, you like a lot of data kind of collapses. So uh, there's a lot of redundancy in the bow variety description, but when you separate like this, you sort of uh, canonically kill the redundancy in some way. Um, so I think I can do vertex functions for this, but I'm really interested in trying to figure out more general. I think that if you want to, you know, study 3D mirror symmetry and uh, these vertex functions are so dependent on the GIT description. I mean, they're it's really interesting the ways that they depend on it. Um, Andre Smiov and I wrote a paper on vertex functions for points, not the GIT varieties. All of them are just points, but their vertex functions are actually pretty interesting. So I really want to do it for more general ones too. So I'm kind of, I can do it. I think I can do it for these, uh, but I want to figure out what happens when I start looking back. Add back with them to see in some way that I can for So, yeah, uh, be, uh, there, I have a very general question. So, I have a very easy dimension in the TPP theory. Yeah. So, are these vertex functions uh, related to? Yeah, uh, for certain cases. So, for um, so the P, so PT. Yeah, so for PT theory for, um, let me say not, not max generality, but um, if you're considering a threefold that looks like this, um, let me just say like P, P1 cross C2. Um, this is right. Yeah, I think this is right. So if you're considering the PT theory of this, uh, maybe with some certain constraints and like markings or something like that. Uh, this should be equivalent to quasi map theory for Hilbert schema points on C2. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you sort of think like uh, quasi maps from P1. So if I have map from P1 to some, you know, parameter space of points in C2, uh, you know, I should be able to think about it. You know, think of its graph should be some curve inside of P1 plus C2. That's kind of the intuition, you know. but you can make this spread. It's not that complicated to write down. Just you can write down the quasi map data to the Hilbert scheme, and you can write down what PT theory studies. It's, you can just explicitly see that they're the same. But I think people say the, the one leg PT vertex is the same as the quasi map vertex. But for DT theory, it's well, the relationships become. I don't understand them that well, but they, they become more complicated. Um, I don't think there's a direct, I mean, there's a conjectured way to do DT theory from PT theory, 
but it's complicated. And I think pausing that theory is uh, like a, if you wanted early, you have to push it through that. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure I understand the basic shape of this kind of thing. So you you have this like virtual uh whatever uh, yeah thing living in the modulus space. You push it forward to an actual like sheet or comments yeah. of sheets or something. Yeah, you push it forward to uh the KPA class. So KPA, yeah. Now is it a it's it's localized KPA class or is it <laughs> oh, okay? So you have to have so this is really only defined in K theory. There's is there no kind of vertical construction that will produce like oh, it's a good question. Oh, that's a piece. I mean, I don't know about that. It doesn't mean that there's not one. Okay. Um, um, but I guess it's defined via localization, and then it's not very better. Not necessarily. Okay. okay. Um, I, I, yeah, I don't know. That's interesting. Maybe you need to fix your properness. You need to kind of work by other grand localization. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which, uh, I, I don't think I've ever read anything. Yeah, people want to talk before the class. This is recorded. No, I, that's a, that would be a neat idea. Yeah, yeah I don't know. I, don't know. Maybe, I mean, it's possible. I mean, yeah, just because I don't know doesn't mean it's like. Uh, okay, no, so I think that's great. Um, and then, but but this case very fast, then, then these vertex, these very big vertex functions are. Just expressing power of that. Is that is that what you uh the vertex functions are so you push forward your your virtual machine. Oh you push forward the power. This what was that? You take a power of the virtual sheet. Right? It's not a power, it's um so the D, do you think of the D as a power? So oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. The the D is a degree. A degree. Yeah, so so quasi map spaces decompose according to some discrete invariant called degree. Okay. So this is like you know, you've got one yeah. big virtual sheet living on this quasi map space, but you can be restricted to each degree. Mm -hmm. Or you can just think that. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. This is for degree first. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's not powers of it. Um, but yeah, so you push that forward, and then you you, uh, you get a K3 class on your target X, and then you just put it into the intermediate series. I mean, this is like the whole philosophy of an intuitive geometry. If you put it forward something very complicated and you put it into a generating series, and then, like, that's where you start seeing actual interesting properties. Somehow, like, if I wanted to just study this on its own, maybe it's not that interesting, or maybe it's hard, but when I put them all together, there's more structure that appears, like these difference equations. If they sort of, if you shift Z and get some difference equation, you sort of naturally have these uh, sheaves for different D that are kind of talking to each other in some way. Any questions? Other questions? Questions from our virtual crowd? The virtual crowd. Well, if not, uh, let's thank Hunter again. Yeah. And, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, see you next week. Hopefully in the same room <laughs> with the tax issues resolved. All right, bye-bye.